morning and welcome to Peace Haven. Our mission here is pretty simple. We exist to glorify God by equipping local members to make global disciples of Jesus who are following Him, formed by Him, and focused on His mission. And we have a huge discipleship event coming up in just three weeks where Vertical Worship will be here with us to lead worship at Disciple Now. Um, this is going to be on Friday and Saturday, March 11th and 12th, and it's primarily a gathering for 6th through 12th grade students, but we're inviting people of all ages to attend the worship sessions because we want everyone to know that Jesus changes everything. Now, if you haven't already registered for the event, but you plan to attend, you can register right now. And what I'm asking you to do, if you would, go ahead and get your phone out, and you can pull up your camera app on your phone, and you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen now. That QR code is going to take you directly to our registration page where you can register as a student for $20 and that's going to include food for the weekend, activities, and also a t-shirt. Or you can register as an adult for the worship sessions only or even as a child for the worship sessions only for a suggested donation of $10. Now if you plan to attend, we're asking that you would register as soon as possible so that we can adequately prepare for the event. Also. We're in need of volunteers to be able to put on a big event like this here at Peace Haven. So if you'd be willing to volunteer for Disciple Now, if you would, just stop by the Welcome Center desk after the service and put your name on the sign-up sheet that's located there. Now, if you're with us for the first time here at Peace Haven, we're so excited and so glad that you're here to worship with us today. Um, in fact, we have a gift that we would like to give you, and that gift is also located at the Welcome Center desk. So make sure you stop by before you leave. Today is choir practice at 415. If you've been praying about joining the choir, this is a great day to do so. Next Sunday is what we call Family Worship Sunday. So if you have a child that normally comes to our kids' churches, this is not the day to do so. Next week they will not be in the clubhouse. They will join us here in the worship center to um, enjoy the service together. Make sure they stop by the Welcome Center desk and get their kids sermon notes so they can get a prize afterwards when they come see me and show me what they learned during the message. And I wanted to say a big thank you to those of you who volunteered for our nursery on Wednesday nights and for those of you who stepped up to help teach lessons and to work in leadership on Wednesday nights in our His Kids program. What an answer to prayer and we're excited to work alongside you. Teenagers, don't forget our summer camp is coming up July 18th through July 22nd. Now I need your $50 deposit annual registration sheet by Sunday, March the 13th, if you want to go on that trip. Oh no, it's happening again. Please make it stop. Please make it stop. Okay, I think we're good. We're implementing some new technology here at the church and it's gonna take some troubleshooting, some ironing out, and some practice to get it to work really well. So we thank you for bearing with us in the meantime. We hope you've enjoyed these announcement videos that we made over the past few weeks. If you have an announcement that you would like to have considered for one of these videos, uh, we now have an online form that you need to fill out by Sunday evening before the next week's video is made. Um, all you need to do in order to fill out that form um, is you can actually scan the QR code that's on the screen right now and it will take you to the form. Or you can find the QR code in the newsletter this week. Or you can even go to our website and you can find the form there.
Aren't you grateful for that today, that the battle belongs to the Lord? He is good. And you know, today as we prepare for the reading of God's word, we want to really focus in on the faithfulness of our God. And uh, we're going to sing a new song today in just a moment, and we're going to introduce it to you, and we'd love to begin doing it some as a, as a congregational worship song, but it just focuses in on the promises of God. As we look at the scriptures, um, and we look specifically at the Old Testament, God made some promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. In the, in the workings of the Old Testament, you see him working to fulfill every single promise that he made to them. And uh, this past couple of weeks, I've been reading through the story of Joseph, and um, I can't help but imagine what Joseph must have been going through in the years that he was sold into slavery and he was uh, elevated to high positions in the places like Potiphar's house and things are going well and then all of a sudden it, the rug's pulled out from under him and he's put into prison and then he finds favor from the Lord and, and God gives him favor in prison and he's put in a high position in the prison and he's over the prison and he's wondering the whole time, God, what are you doing? But in the midst of it, he, he continues to believe and to hold on to the faithfulness of God, believing the promise that was made. And he never lost faith. And I can't help but, you know, think about how in our lives, day in and day out, a lot, a lot of times we think about, God, why are you allowing something to happen in my life? Why am I going through this circumstance? But when we look at the history of who our God is, and we look at the promises that he's made in the past, and we look at how he fulfilled those promises, even in the hard times, even in the circumstances that, that people would have never wanted to have to go through, we should find such comfort and confidence in who our God is as a result of looking at those stories and, and remembering who he is. And so as we, you know, look at the text that we're reading today, we're reading Psalm 105. We're going to see the recounting of those promises and, and the praise that the people of God give to him for his faithfulness uh, to make good on every promise that he's ever made. And then we're going to declare that he is that same God today. And we're going to sing that in this song. And so read the scripture with me today, Psalm 105. And then after we read the scripture, I want you to be seated. And I just want you to focus in on the words that we're going to sing together. And now, if you know the song, sing it with us. I want to give you a break from, from standing, and I want you to really focus in on the song. So let's read the scripture together, Psalm 105. The heading for this psalm is the eternal faithfulness of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the words which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. When they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. And listen to this. He sent a man before them, Joseph who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. And listen to this, the end of the Psalm, verse 42. The rest of the Psalm after that goes on to talk about how you know, the children of Israel grew in number in the land of Egypt during those days and how God prospered them. But of course, they were in bondage and in slavery. And it goes on to talk about how God faithfully delivered them from that bondage. And listen to how the psalm ends. For he remembered his holy promise. He remembered his holy promise and Abraham, his servant, and brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise the Lord. And that's what we do today. As we look at our God and the faithfulness that he has had to make good on every promise that he's ever made, we can trust him when we read the promises of the New Testament, 
promises like he works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We can trust those promises because our God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today as we sing this song, we are praising him for his faithfulness. So be seated. Listen to the words of this song and sing it with us if you know it.
you guys can go ahead and stand and worship with us. We're going to sing one more song in response to that last song about his grateful and his faithfulness to us. And we're just going to praise the Father this morning. You guys can go ahead and stand. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word from a throne.
right, thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, just want to ask you to do this, if you would, please, today. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. While you're doing that, I just want to make mention of a few people. If you'll remember Reba Hollingsworth, continue to remember Reba as she has her battle with cancer. I know she would appreciate that so much. I saw Rick this morning, and uh, Rick is uh, doing somewhat good today, you know, and uh, he had a decent report the other day, but we're still praying for Rick, and we just really want to see uh, God do a work in both Rick and Reba's life, and so I would ask you today, if you would, if you'd put them, put them on your prayer list, Rick needs a miraculous healing, Reba needs a miraculous healing, there are others in our church that need miraculous healings as well, and I can't take time to mention everybody, but if you would, please just remember these today, put them on your prayer list. We're in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, you know, typically a pastor's message is one of peering into the lives of his congregation. Over the next four weeks, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. Instead of me peering into your life, I'm going to ask you somewhat to peer into mine. Um, very seldom do pastors preach on uh, the pastoral epistles or preach on uh, just the office of pastor, uh, just preach on even the polity of the church, but I do think it's very important for us as a church to understand uh, what our polity is or what our church government is and what it's foundationed in. Uh, there's basically three different types of church government, and I could break that down a little bit more, but there's Episcopalian, uh, there's Presbyterian, and then there's Congregational. Uh, we're not Presbyterian. A Presbyterian church typically has a uh, rule, or they're led by several people, ruled by several people, actually leaving the congregation out of the major decisions in the church. Then you have an Episcopalian uh, set up where it's normally uh, just ruled over by one person, one bishop. And then you have what's called a Congregational church. We are a congregational church. Now, what that means is simply this. That means that at the, at the end of the day, the congregation rules the church. Now, of course, and I'll, I'll specify this. You say, well, I thought Christ was the head. He is the head. We'll talk about that in a moment. Because ultimately, Jesus is the ruler and Jesus is the head of the church. But in terms, uh, humanly speaking, the congregation has the last word. That's why it's so important that your church membership be saved members. Here at Peace Saving Baptist Church, we require that you be a saved member, a saved baptized member. Here's why. Because we are making decisions, spiritual decisions, that require the priesthood of the believer to be at work in our lives. It requires that we be filled and we be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and that we be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And lost people cannot be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul specifies over uh, in his letter, first letter to the church at Corinth that the natural man can't even understand. He can't discern spiritual things. And so that's why as a membership we require people to be saved. That's one of the reasons. There's several reasons why. But that is one of the reasons why that we require for a member to be saved is simply this. It's that we need people in our congregation to be going the same direction, to be following the same Christ, to be indwelt and filled by the same Spirit. And so as we work through this, please recognize that our church is a congregational church. We're not Presbyterian, we're not Episcopalian, uh, we are congregational. For some time I've been mentioning the prospect of training and selecting elders. And I know many of you, when I say the term elder, I'm sure as you've been reading along in Scripture, you've come across it for sure in the Old Testament, and you've come across that term in the New Testament, and, and you, you may have just passed over it and just thought, you know, well, I don't really know what that is, and it's not really that much, it's not that uh, important. Well, it's very important. And for the next four weeks, I'm going to de be devoting our Sunday morning services uh, to biblical eldership in the New Testament church that we might understand what the Bible actually teaches concerning this subject. I've intentionally and purposely entitled this sermon series, Out with the New, In with the Old. And I know some of you are going to think, you know, that that's backwards, but it's actually, uh, you know, it's kind of a play on words because typically what we would say is out with the old and in with the new. But what we need to recognize is this, in our church polity, and you will see this as we are moving along, I want us to be aware that our church polity here at Peace Haven actually does not resemble a New Testament first century model. Now, I don't want to blow you out of the water, uh, because I know that traditionally uh, we are accustomed to what we do here, but I just want to bring to light some things from the New Testament model and the New Testament pattern that is actually in contradiction to what we are doing here. If we study the teachings of Peter, if we study the teachings of Luke and Paul and James, we will understand that there are some things that we need to be adding, maybe some things that we need to be taking away in our church government. Biblical eldership, as presented by the New Testament authors, here's what it does. Here's the advantage. Number one, it provides accountability. And God knows we need more accountability in our churches. So it, account it provides more accountability. It actually um, um, provides more gift utilization 
for some people that may be called to this office that haven't had the opportunity. It gives stronger leadership. It, of course, you know, gives doctrinal protection. And really, it just enhances the overall pastoral care. And so as we work through this, I know many of you are already raising your eyebrows and saying, Pastor John, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I just want you to understand, to emulate other models outside of that which is set forth clearly in the New Testament is actually to weaken these areas that are so necessary for the health of a local church congregation. So for the very purpose of strengthening our leadership and strengthening our knowledge and strengthening our accountability here at, here at Peace Haven, I intend to examine over the next four weeks several New Testament passages on this subject of biblical eldership that we might consider adopting a more biblical polity and, and a more biblical church government into our pastoral ministry here at Peace Haven. Now again, don't allow yourself, you know, don't allow your mind to be blown already. Just realize, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a change, but it's not so dramatic that you're going to ha have your mind blown. Also, I need to tell you this. Most of the time, I know I, I'm going to ask you to do something over the next four weeks that I know you don't like to do normally, and you sure don't like to do it at church, okay? I'm going to ask you to think, all right? All right, I know some of you are going to be saying, "My Pastor John, we're drinking." You know, you're not going to get all of this, and I do understand that. And there are going to be times when you zone out, and you know, you're going to be like, "You know, Pastor John, you you kind of took off and left." But if you will pay careful attention, and if you'll just listen very very intently, I think that you'll get this. It's not really that hard, and I'll tell you why. John Bowman is not the most intelligent guy you know. He's not even close. And if I can get this, you can get this. But as we're working through, just pay careful attention. Most of us have encountered the term elder in our New Testament scripture reading, but there's some confusion in churches as to the identity of the office of elder in the church. If, if elders are mentioned in the New Testament, then we need to know who they are, and we need, to, we need to know what their identity is. Some churches just simply ignore the term altogether, while some have misidentified and misappropriated this office as being synonymous or at least similar to a deacon. Now, that's been one of the biggest questions that I've been asked since I've been talking about this. As people come to us, are they taking, if we, if we implement elders, are they taking the place of a deacon? And the answer is absolutely not, because deacons are just as scriptural as elders are. And so you maintain your deacon ministry and you maintain your elder ministry. What we need to do is we need to find out what an elder actually is. So scripture identifies the office as, of elder. It's a necessary and a very distinct function uh, or distinct in function and in title. So in the first century New Testament local churches, elders did this. They exercised key leadership in educating. They exercised key leadership in edifying believers. Now, there's several questions that I know that you're going to ask, and I'm, I'm going to answer hopefully all of these and hopefully even more than these. So let me give you these, four que or these, these several questions uh, that I'm sure you're going to ask. Number one, what office do elders feel? Number two, how many elders should be in each local church? We'll answer that next week. Number three, who qualifies as an elder? We'll answer that in sermon four, or no, sermon three. But then this, what's the difference between elders and other church leaders? And so, to some degree, I'm going to answer all of these in all the messages, but I'll specify certain questions and certain answers as we move through this. But throughout this four-part series, I hope to answer these questions among so many others and clarify what Scripture teaches about eldership in the local church and how we as a local assembly must respond in our development of church polity or our church government structure here at Peace Haven. In essence, Scripture is very clear that the term elder is synonymous with two other New Testament words that represent pastoral leadership in the local church. So throughout this sermon series, we will clarify these words and their interconnectedness and how they are defined scripturally throughout the, uh, throughout the New Testament. First of all, I want to talk to you about elders in the Old Testament, though, because I think we need to have a little bit of a grasp as to what office or what function elders served in the Old Testament. In Acts 20, 17, look there just for a moment. I'll introduce you, first of all, to what's going on here at Acts. And then we're going to come back to this. Paul is meeting uh, for the very last time with the Ephesian elders. He's in Miletus. He calls on the Ephesian elders to travel some 30 miles to come down there and to meet with him. This is the last time he will meet with them. This is his last missionary journey. And, of course, Paul is on his way. He's going to Jerusalem. He'll end up in Rome. But here's what happens. In verse 17, he said, Luke tells us in the book of Acts, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church. So we see that in the New Testament. But I want to go back, and I'm going to look again at the Old Testament just for a moment. I'm going to take a close look at these elders again in the New Testament. We'll use that as a template for our polity here at Peace Haven. But before we examine these elders in, in Acts 20, I want to explore some elders in the Old Testament. 
For clarification, I do want to emphasize that although there are some similarities between the Old Testament Jewish elders and the New Testament elders that we're going to be talking about in the church, there are obvious differences as well, and we'll point those out as we move through. But the first mention of elders in Scripture occurs in Genesis chapter 50, verse 7. And it said, the setting is Jacob's funeral. And so we're not going to take a lot of time to look at that because it's an Egyptian setting with the Egyptian elders. But I do want you to know that the first mention of Jewish elders is Exodus chapter 3. Those are the ones we're going to focus on. Let me read this with you real quickly. Exodus chapter 3, the Bible says this, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, this is of course God instructing Moses, the, God, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. He goes on to say, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the, the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Pezites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, and you and the elders to, of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of Israel has met with us. And now, please, let us go there, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I'm having you to look at that because this is when we're introduced to Jewish elders as they accompany Moses to confront and petition Pharaoh. In this particular context, the elders join uh, uh, Moses to petition Pharaoh, you know, uh, to allow the enslaved Israelites to go out and sacrifice in the desert territory. I'm not going to have you turn there and I don't have it for you today, but later on in Numbers chapter 11, God instructed Moses to invite 70 of these elders to come and to the tent of meeting that he might bestow upon them a portion of the spirit that he had placed on Moses. So we already see when we go back and first mention what these elders are doing. They're assisting the man of God. They're assisting the assigned leader. And they are joining together with him and receiving a, you know, a much of a, a similar spirit and a similar leadership quality uh, that Moses himself had had. So throughout the Old Testament, the actual duties of these elders is somewhat nebulous. It's not necessarily clear. We do know that they served in some capacity along with the priesthood. We also know in several incidents that they operated judicially and they operated administratively. But again, we're not told exactly what's going on in the Old Testament. We just know they led Israel and they obviously led their families. So regarding Old Testament elder identity, though, I want to give you just a few words here, you know, that, that go back. Number one, the Hebrew word is, is zakwin. And again, uh, it simply means this. In the Hebrew, it simply means a beard. You know, we're, we're, when we're looking at these elders, we're trying to figure out, okay, who are they? How old are they? What are they doing? Well, you know, again, I'm going to give you these, this information just to kind of give you an idea as far as maybe their age. In the Aramaic, the word is sib, one with gray hair. And then, you know, those of you who are taking our uh, post-test, you'll need to familiarize yourself with this term from the Septuagint, the presbyteros, and that is simply the Greek word older man. So what we see is we see a man with a beard, a man old enough to grow a beard, a man with gray hair, you know, a little bit of gray hair. I'm starting to get some gray hair, so maybe I'll qualify at some point. And then an older man, you know, I definitely qualify at that. How many of you, you remember when you thought 52 was old? Anybody remember that? How many of you think 52 is young now? I do, <laughs> you know. And how many of you would like to be 52 again? All right, so, you know, I'm looking around the room here, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we're talking about age, all of this is relative. I'm just giving you kind of what the, the Bible indicates to us through a word study. But the Bible doesn't indicate an exact age. It just kind of gives us some hints there. Scripture reveals no definite age requirement for Old Testament eldership. But clearly the language itself, from that we can derive that a reasonable age of maturity was required. And, of course, age itself did not qualify a man for eldership but also spiritual maturity. You know, sometimes we get this idea, and, and, it's, and it's, so, it's so inaccurate. Maturity and spirituality do not necessarily, co necessarily come with age. Is that a true statement? Maturity and spirituality does not necessarily come with age. Age itself, you know, and as we're talking about this, you know, we're seeing, okay, it needs to be a man who could grow a beard, it needs to be a man with some gray hair, it needs to be a man, he's an older man, you know, and, and again, all of that stuff is going to be relative, but at the end of the day, we need to understand something. Just because a man is older does not mean that he is spiritual. Just because a man is older does not mean that he is mature. Maturity and spirituality come with the taking on of responsibility and a submission to Christ in their life. 
and and, and, an ongoing perpetual obedience to Christ in their life, a continuous filling of the Holy Spirit, a continuous walking with God. And so please recognize, you know, that just because a person is older does not mean they're spiritually mature. There's a lot of people that are older who have never grown in Christ. There's a lot of guys who are somewhat younger who are growing dramatically. And so we need to keep that in mind as we move forward on this. In Acts chapter 20, and we'll look at this in just a moment, Paul emphasizes a calling. But he also, you know, he's emphasizing a maturity, a spirituality, uh, a man, you know, who is wise, a man who is spiritually mature. So much can be said about eldership in the Old Testament, but for the sake of time, we're going to simply acknowledge that elders played integral roles in Israel's leadership from Moses all the way through the Maccabean era. Now, when I talk about the Maccabean era, we're, we're going back a couple of centuries before Christ. I want to familiarize your, you with a, a term uh, that maybe you're unfamiliar with. It's called the intertestamental period. When somebody says the intertestamental period, this is all they're talking about. They're talking about that 400 years between the end of the Old Testament in your Bible and the beginning of the writings of the New Testament in your Bible. For example, you know, the end, uh, the prophecy end would be Malachi. The, the historical end would be Esther and Nehemiah in your Bible. But when you get to Malachi, you know, you'll notice uh, there's really nothing written for the next 400 years because there's a famine of the Word of God. And so when we talk about the intertestamental period, there's 400 years where God was completely silent until you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you start reading about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if somebody mentions the intertestamental period, they're talking about that period. If I mention the Maccabean era, it's going to be within that period there. That's when the Feast of Lights came into existence. That's when uh, Hanukkah came into existence. And it's a great thing. One of the men in our church just came to me a, a couple of weeks ago and said he wanted to read the Apocrypha. And asked me if there was any value in it. The Apocrypha are books that were written uh, during and about the time uh, in that intertestamental period. They're not considered to be inspired, although when the King James translation first came out, they were included in that. They're not included in ours now. It's included in the Catholic Bible. It's not included in your Bible now. You say, well, do they have any value? Yeah, they have historical value, but they are not inspired of God. But it is from that period that we learn a few things about the, what was going on. And by the way, Antiochus Epiphanes, that was in 165 B.C. That was when he desecrated the temple. It was during that time, and that was a fulfillment of one of Daniel's prophecies. So it, there is some great value that is there. But it was during this particular time that the elders in, 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 in amongst the Jews, they became known as the Gerusha. And I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the Gerusha actually existed in the 2nd century B.C. It consisted of 71 members, and they all served as a harbinger for what we know now as the Jewish Sanhedrin. Whenever you read about the Jewish council in the New Testament or you read about the Sanhedrin, that is 71 members, the, the 71st member being the high priest himself. And so during the intertestamental period, during the Maccabean era, the Gerusha served as a harbinger. It was made up of elders, and these elders had to, command, had to possess a command for the language of the Hebrews and the law of Moses. And so beyond being a certain, having a certain wisdom and beyond you know, having a certain age, they had to have a certain command of God's word. Now, by the time the Sanhedrin, you know, was completely put together, there were scribes, rulers, priests in this supreme council, but elders were in this council. So among the Jewish people, eldership was, it was a very significant ministry around the synagogues throughout the Maccabean era and into the first century. And because of this, some of the early Christian assemblies in the first century were referred to as new synagogues. Now, that's not exactly what it was, but that's what they just considered it to be. You know, it's a new synagogue, and they considered eldership just to be a continuation of the Old Testament into the New Testament. I just want to clarify once again something. You know, there were elders in the Old Testament, and there is some similarity between the elders in the Old Testament and the elders in the New Testament church. But there are, are glaring differences as well, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So as you read through the Old Testament, you say, well, I see elders in the Old Testament. How are they connected to elders in the New Testament? Well, to some degree, you know, the Jewish people, they understood, they already understood that elders, uh, what they were and how old they were supposed to be or what they were supposed to represent. And so as we move into the New Testament, you know, uh, they probably already kind of had some idea as to how this whole thing is supposed to work. Here's the problem. In our day today, we don't really talk in those terms. 
And so we need, to, we need to define exactly what the Bible is talking about. The Jews in the first century, you know, Luke, he didn't really clarify. Acts chapter 11, for those taking the post-test, Acts chapter 11 is the very first time that elders are mentioned in a, in a church setting. Acts 14.23 is the first time that we see elders being selected and are elected in a church setting by Paul and Barnabas. But as we get into Acts chapter 20, here's where I want to get, because I want to talk about these elders in Ephesus. These elders in Ephesus is going to serve as a template for what we are looking at. Before we dive into the New Testament passage on eldership in the local church, let's quickly review God's hierarchy for the church. Right now you say, Pastor John, you know, this stuff doesn't, isn't really interesting to me. Well, it may not be, but we need to know it. We have to know it. So let me look here on our screen. Number one, we see Christ as the head. Christ as the head. Number two, we see deacons and we see elders. Uh, they are the selected leaders in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. If you go back to Christ, I don't have this passage for you. We'll look at it later in the series. But Christ is the head of the church. We have to know that. It, we have to know that. He is the head of the church. He is the head of this church. Can I get an amen? He is the head. He is in charge of this church. You say, well, Pastor John, you said the congregation was in charge. The congregation is the human element that's in charge. Christ himself is in charge of this church. Secondly, leadership-wise, elders and deacons. You'll notice, do you notice what's missing from uh, number two? What? Okay, that's, that's key. Elders and deacons are the selected leaders in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, and I'll clarify that later. And then the membership. And this is, this is really where it, where it all falls on the congregation. But the membership, what do they do? Well, they exercise their gifts. But they're also following the leadership. But they're not just following the leadership. They're selecting and electing the leadership. That's why we're doing this series is because we have to know who is qualified to even serve as an elder or a pastor or an overseer or a shepherd. We have to know who is qualified, and the congregation at the end of the day has to make that decision. You say, Pastor John, what, so what is our church going to look like? What, does it, what should it look like? It should be pastor-led and congregation-ruled with Christ at the head. That's as simple as I know how to put it. Pastor-led, congregation-ruled with Christ at the head. He is at the top. You say, well, Pastor John, I just don't understand. How does all that work together? That's the purpose of what we're doing. So with all that understood, or with all that confused, right, we're going to look at Acts chapter 20, and a, rightly appropriate the role and function of elders from this setting and in this context. So let's, let's begin reading in verse 17. Once again, Paul, he's in Miletus. He has sent to the Ephesian elders. He's called for the elders of the church uh, in Ephesus. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to be by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks of the Gentiles, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Now, again, I want to clarify, this is the very last time. It's a very emotional moment for Paul because he has gotten to know these guys. He has been instrumental in, in, in the inception of this church and the inception of this leadership. And so it's a very emotional time because he knows he's going to Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's going to happen after that. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. So he knows that that's coming for him. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Can I say something right there? Wouldn't that be something amazing? Those of you who are following along, did you catch that? Did you catch what he just said? I'm going to go back and see. He says in verse 20, 26, Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all men. Verse 27, For I am not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul right there, he says this, and I think this is so incredible. He says, there, there's, there's no blood on my hands. He said, I have declared the gospel. 
I have declared it liberally. I have declared it perpetually. I've declared it to every man that I can. I have not withheld it. I have spoken it out, and I have spoken it in boldness. I have spoken it in love. I have spoken it in the power of the Spirit of God. And he, he's, he's, he's realizing he's coming to the end, and he can say this. He can say, the, no man's blood's on my hands. How many of us can say that? How many of us have, have, have embraced the gospel and shared the gospel to the very point that we can say, toward the end of our lives, we can say, no man's blood is on my hands. Right now, who has God led you to speak to about the gospel that you have shunned? Where have you been hesitant? Can you right now say, if this is the last day of your life, that no blood is on my hands? I have shared the gospel I have presented the gospel, I have spoke the gospel, and I've done it in the way that God has called me to do it, and there's no man out there, no woman out there in my circle that has not heard the gospel from me. I hope that we can all one day say that. I hope that you can say it today. It might be some of you can say, you know, Pastor John, right now I have shared the gospel with every person that God has led me, every person I've intersected with. That's basically what Paul is saying. He's gone from town to town. He's gone from city to city. He shared the gospel, I mean, in the, in, 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 just in the midst of intense persecution. And he even says here, he says, I also know from the, from the Holy Spirit of God, not only have I already gone through that, but I'm going to be going through that again. And by the way, that's true. But look at verse 28, because this is where we want to land today. Therefore, watch what he says. Now remember who he's addressing. He's addressing the elders of the Ephesian church. He says, therefore, because of all this, take heed to yourselves. First thing he says to these guys is, hold each other accountable. He's telling these guys, you guys, you are the leaders of this church. You hold each other accountable. That's your job. First thing first. Thing first. You cannot reproduce in others what you do not possess in yourself. And so first of all, first and foremost, you hold each other accountable. Or in other words, take heed to yourselves. Now watch what he says secondly. He said, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's a key word there. Underline it in your Bible. Make a note of it. He says, elders, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit of God has made you. This is key. There is no elder unless the Holy Spirit has made him an elder. He doesn't just decide, I want to be an elder. He doesn't just fly up and say, oh, I want to be in charge. If there's an elder in your church, and we'll define what they are as we move along. You've probably already picked up on what they are. But if there's an elder in your church, it better be somebody that the Holy Spirit of God has put in that position. It cannot be someone who just says, I want to be an elder. It can't be somebody who can grow a beard. It can't be somebody with some gray hair. It can't be just somebody with some age. It cannot be that person. It has to be a person, according to Paul here, a person that is willing to be held accountable and hold other leaders accountable, and he's going to hold the flock accountable, and he can declare within himself that he has been called by none other than the Holy Spirit of God that has made him, here's a key word, an overseer. And watch this, another key word, to, what's the next word? To shepherd, another key word. Shepherd, the church of, what does it say? All right, that's key. So many things here. Number one, he's got to be willing to be accountable. He's got to hold others accountable. He has to be called by the Spirit of God. He has to be called to be an overseer, and he has to be called to shepherd, to shepherd or to pastor the church. And here it is, not of himself. It, this church does not belong to John Bowman. It never has. It never will. It does not matter who stands here. It does not matter who stands in Pastor Jared's place. It does not matter who stands in any elder's place, any leadership position. It does not matter. Here's what matters. Christ is the head. He purchased the church with his own blood. It belongs to him. So when Paul says here, the church of God, he is specifying to every elder, every overseer, every shepherd, he is specifying don't ever, ever, ever get to the point where you think this is your church. I've had people to say, you know, how's your church doing? My first thing is, I don't have a church. Now, I'm not being a smart aleck, I'm just clarifying. They say, how's your church doing, John? I don't have a church. I thought you were the pastor of the church. I am a pastor of the church, but it's not mine. 
it belongs to him. So how's his church doing? Amen. Somebody say amen. I'm not moving on till we do. It's his church. It's his church. So read on. Our Bible says this. For I know. Say, so what's the purpose of these guys? I mean, what, 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 why, are they even, why are they in existence? Paul tells us. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. I, I know i got a friend of mine right now. He is in a church. He's not the pastor. He's an interim pastor at a church right now. But right now at a meeting just the other night, a couple of guys got up and made a determination. These guys are deacons. And they got up and made a determination that they were no longer going to require people to be baptized. They said it, they don't believe it's a command. Now, here's what we do know. We do know that baptism is not a sacrament. We do know that a person doesn't have to be baptized to be saved. However, we do know that baptism is a command. Somebody help me. If somebody at the church stands up and says, baptism's not a command, tell them to sit down. Here's why. If I ever say something like that, say, Pastor John, it's time for you to sit down and probably time for you to leave. But you see, here's the thing. You say, well, that's just very subtle. Well, number one, why would deacons stand up and make a decision anyway? We'll talk about that. But number two, they're wrong. They're wrong. And so you never know when somebody's going to come into your church and start speaking, as Paul says, perverse or untrue things, unbiblical things. What's the purpose? Why are these elders? Why is it so important for these elders to hold each other accountable? Because they need to be spiritual men, and they need to have spiritual accountability. And then they need to have a certain humility about them. But they need to have a certain knowledge about them as far as the Scripture goes as well. And they've got to have a spiritual maturity about themselves. Because they are overseeing the church. They are shepherding the church. And it is their responsibility to teach the truth. It is their responsibility to maintain the doctrines of the Bible. And so when we're talking about elders, man, I mean, there's something very, very important here. It's previously explained in Acts chapter 20. Luke records Paul's final meeting with the elders from the church at Ephesus. And what he's done, again, he's called these elders together. They've traveled some 30 miles to receive his farewell address. Now, here's what, those of you taking my test, you'll need to know this, okay? So there's three terms that are, we're going to look at as interchangeable. Bring up those three terms, if you would, please. Number one. Presbyterus, sometimes it'll say presbyteros, presbyteros just simply means that it's plural. The us is plural, if it's os, it's singular. Presbyterus is used by Luke here, and it is describing elders. But then he uses a verb. He says shepherd. It's, 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 a, it's an imperative. It's, you, you, this is what you do. And so poimenein is actually the verb form that we're going to, I'm giving you today, poimen really in its noun form, but it's a pastor and a shepherd. And then you have episcopus. Y'all say that with me. Isn't that just fun to say? Episcopus could be episcopos. By the way, how many of you notice presbyteros? How, what does that kind of sound like? Pres and episcopus kind of sounds like. All right, so you, you can kind of see where they're getting their words from. All right, so but you see a bishop. And you see an overseer. Now, here, here's what we're going to establish as we work through here. I'm going to give you this. I'll give you some evidence for this today. But I'm just going to go ahead and tell you uh, what the thesis kind of is, what the, uh, the proposition will be. It's that these three terms are synonymous. So as you see elders in your Bible, whenever you see it, you know it's also a pastor. It's also a shepherd. It's also a bishop. It's also an overseer. So when you see those terms in your New Testament, New Testament Scripture, you will see them associated several times with each other, at least enough to where you understand they are synonymous with each, each, with each other. And so as we understand that, let's move forward. At first glance, at Paul's verbal arrangement, what do you find here? In verse 28, you will find all three of these terms. Well, verse 17 tells us that there are elders that are present. Then you get to verse 28, we see what? We see shepherd the flock. We also see oversee. 
And so what we're understanding is we are understanding that from Scripture, all three of these terms represent the exact same office. I'm going to have you look over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Pull that up if you would, please. Now, before we read this, there are certain, uh, there are certain books we call pastoral epistles. So if somebody refers or somebody says something about pastoral epistles, maybe uh, an epistle, number one, is just a letter. So if you hear somebody say epistle, that's a letter. That's all it is. So when you hear somebody say pastoral epistle, they're talking about pastoral letters. Or in other words, these are the letters that are written specifically to describe, you know, and to uh, instruct pastors themselves. There are three pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. That's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Now I want you to see something here. The Bible says this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop he desires a good work keep it there just for a second go back this is a faithful saying if a man desires the position of a bishop now if you were paying close attention while ago and you probably weren't but if you're paying close attention while ago you remember episcopos is a bishop or an overseer and so we already pretty much know as we're looking at this if a man desires the position of a pastor because a pastor is what he's a bishop he's an overseer he's a shepherd right all right, so he's an elder. And so as we look at this, this is what Paul is talk, talking about. He says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now watch this in verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and here it is. This is what differentiates it. You know, when you read, you'll read only 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll see the requirements of a deacon. There's one outstanding thing. There's, there's, there's some subtle things here, but there's one outstanding thing that separates a qualification for a deacon and a qualification for an elder, a pastor, an overseer. It's that he's able to teach. He's able to teach. He has to be able to teach. Now, you say, Pastor John, why is that so important? Well, you remember back in Acts chapter 20? Do you remember what Paul said in Acts chapter 20? Paul said, I, here's what you were supposed to do. You're supposed to hold each other accountable, hold the church accountable. You must be called by the Spirit of God. Savage wolves are coming in, so you must protect the flock. Now, how do you protect the flock from false doctrine? Here's what you do. You teach true doctrine. And so, all Paul is saying, what Paul is saying here is this. He is saying, if you desire the office of a bishop or an overseer, and you remember overseeing, is one of the things that Paul said must be being done by the elders in Ephesus. He said over as an overseer, as a shepherd, as an elder. And so here in the pastoral epistle, what Paul says is, Paul says, if you desire the office, by the way, is it okay to desire the office of a bishop? Go back to verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. So is it okay to desire the office? Sure it is. Sure it is. If the Holy Spirit is giving you the desire. It's a desire that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm going to say this parenthetically. I'm going to ask the men, the men and young men in our church, it may be that nobody's ever even asked, asked you, have you ever considered the call of God on your life? Have you ever considered that maybe God is calling you to this office? You say, well, Pastor John, I've never thought about it, you know. I mean, I just figured that's what you did, you know. You, you surrender to preach, and you go to Bible college, and you go to seminary, and, you know, uh, you know then you, you, well, here's the thing. There's a lot of men that I believe God has called to this position, to this office, as we will see, that maybe have never been to Bible college. Bible college doesn't make you a pastor. God makes you a pastor. God calls you. And I think there's so many young men and so maybe some older men who maybe God had, had, had you kind of pricked your heart a little bit, maybe in a message, or you, you had this thing where you felt like, you know, I need to do this, but there's no opportunity. Well, we're going to provide that opportunity if the Holy Spirit of God gives you that desire. It's a perfect desire from Him. And if you are qualified, as we'll see in, in Sermon 3, then it might very well be that there are men sitting right here that God is calling to this office who've never even considered it. 
Now, here's the thing. If you want to be this because you say, well, Pastor John, I think it's kind of cool for you to get up and get to yell at everybody every week. Well, if that's the reason you want to do it, don't do it, okay? You say, well, I think it's kind of cool, you know, that people call you whatever they call you and hold you in this regard or whatever. Well, if that's your reason for doing it, please understand, uh, it ain't all that. There's a whole lot that goes with it. What you see on Sunday morning is not what it actually is. But if God's called you to do it, you can't do anything else. Now, that doesn't mean you don't work a job. Paul made tents. It doesn't mean you can't be bivocational. But realize this. There are men that God wants to call because this world, listen, we're in a war zone, and we need more men who are standing up and teaching the truth. And so if you desire the office of a bishop, an overseer, a pastor, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do exactly what I do. But here's the thing. I will tell you this. I can't even do what I do. I can't even, you say, Pastor John, that doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense. I can't do what I do. If a message I preach pricks your heart, convicts your heart, draws a lost sinner to salvation, the Holy Spirit of God does that. I didn't do it. His Word does it. His Spirit does that. And so if the Lord is speaking to you and calling you into some kind of ministry like this, just go ahead and say, I can't do it. That's okay. That's, that's the first thing you need to admit. I cannot do it. However, He can do it through me. Somebody say amen. And that's exactly what's, what Paul is talking about here. You desire the office of a bishop. Well, you desire a good thing. That's a good work. That is a good work. But make sure that it's a godly work. Make sure that it's a God-called work. But he goes on to say, if you're going to do that, here's what you have to be able to do. And you have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to be a teacher of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4, 11. The Bible says this. Paul says, and he himself, being Christ, Gave some, these are the gifts for the church, uh, some of the, the leadership gifts for the church, not all the gifts, those, that's 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. But in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, he specifies something here, and some of these, you know, the apostles and some prophets, uh, that's going to be more first century oriented, but watch what the Bible says. Christ himself gave some to the church, to leadership to the church, to be apostles, we know that's already come and gone, you know, in the true, in the true sense of the word, not the generic sense of the word, some prophets, again, the same some evangelists, but watch what he says here, and some pastors and teachers. Now, I'm going to argue this point, and, and I, I wish I could argue it more definitely from a grammatical standpoint, but I can't, but I am going to say this. I believe that this is talking about four offices, not five. And here's why. You'll find an, the article before, uh, you know, some to be apostles, there's the article, some, 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 and then after teachers, or before teachers, there is no sum. Now, for those of you who are Greek grammarians, all three of you, you know that there is the Granville Sharp rule that can kind of apply here, except for that these nouns are plural. And so, again, for those three of you who are thinking about it, we can apply it here directly. However, with the, with the absence of the article before teachers, and this is the only point I'm going to make here, and I don't want to get too, too, you know, detailed. I believe that this is four offices, and I believe the fourth office is pastor slash teacher. Pastor slash teacher. By the way, interesting note. Poimain is used throughout Scripture in the New Testament. It's mostly translated shepherd. This is the only time poimain as a noun is translated pastor in the New Testament. This is where we get the term pastor from this one passage. Everywhere else that's referring to pastors, you're going to find elders, overseers, shepherds. This is the one time in the whole New Testament that this office is referred to as a pastor in the English language and so I don't want to mess you up there I just want you to know that elder overseer shepherd is the more common usage from the English standpoint 
I mentioned a while ago the pastoral epistle, epistles. Let's look at Titus real quick, all right? For this reason, Paul says to Titus, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint, watch what he tells him to do. He says, appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Now watch what he says. It goes on to say, if a man, here's a qualification, if a man is blameless, that doesn't mean he's perfect, it just means that he is living a life that represents Christ, you know, in a very reputable fashion. If a man is blameless, if he's the husband of one wife, by the way, that's why I don't want to make anybody mad today, but, you know, sometimes you just get mad for, for reasons. It's hard to be a woman and be the husband of one wife. Now, again, I know there's all kinds of, of uh, textual gymnastics that people work this work on this thing and say, oh, it can just mean spouse, it can mean this. But here's the thing. If you're a woman and you're the husband of one wife, you've got other problems going on that disqualify you. So this is why I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a misogynist. I'm not a male chauvinist. I'm really not. I'm only speaking to you about what the Bible actually says. The Bible says a husband of one wife, that simply means you need to be a man. And, I, and, and let me go a step further. You need to be a man at birth. Everybody with me? All right, all right. Because I have to clarify, there's a loophole there. You have to be a man. Well, I'm a, I used to be a woman, now I'm a man. Or maybe I'm fluid, you know. I'm gender fluid. I think I'm a, I think I'm a man today or I think I'm a woman today. You know, and again, I'm not trying to be stupid. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to, to be funny. I'm just saying, you know, in the world that we live in now, I have to say things I didn't have to say 20 years ago for clarification. So I have what? He's, he's blameless. He's the husband of one wife. Now, I know there are, there are women pastors in our county who are going to be so mad at me, but I invite you to come. I'll have a conversation with you. It'll be civil conversation, but you need to explain to me how you're the husband of one wife. If you can prove that to me, I'll come back and apologize. Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop, there, there it is, and remember a bishop is an overseer, same thing, must be blameless. But here's, here, see what just happened though. Something just happened. First of all, Paul is addressing elders. And then suddenly he says, for a bishop. Now I want you to notice the qualifications for the bishop. He must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violence, not greedy for money, keep going, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Here's what you find in this passage. I'm just going to say it very briefly. Some people have taken this passage and they've said, well, that proves there's a distinction between an elder and a bishop. Well, first of all, first of all, doesn't the, the requirements sound awfully similar? Secondly, as you read in the context, Paul says appoint elders in every city, and then he says for a bishop must be. I mean, just, just from the reading, it's a continuation of an elder to a bishop, but they're the same thing. And here's how we know. The elders in Acts chapter 20, what were they told to do? They were told to guard the doctrine of the church. How were they told to do it? We see in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, where the Bible talks about being a pastor, teacher. We see in 1 Timothy how that a bishop must be able to teach. And then what do we see here? Just in the last part of this, notice what he says. He says that he may be able by what? Sound doctrine. What's he going to do with it? Well, he's going to teach it. He's going to exhort. He's going to convict those who contradict. And so, you know, my main point today is this. As you read through Scripture, when you see the term elder, you see the term pastor, you see the term shepherd, you see the term overseer, they are all speaking about the exact same thing office because there's only two offices in the church there is the elder and there is the deacon philippians chapter one look at this real quickly because th some people have used this you know to confuse as well paul and timothy 
bond servants of Jesus Christ. Paul is identifying, I'm writing this letter along with Timothy, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. He doesn't say anything about any elders. Now here's, here's the problem. In Acts 14, 23, Paul made it a habit. Every time that he started a church, as quickly as he could, he would appoint elders in that church. Now, the Bible doesn't say exactly how they were selected and elected. We'll talk about that later because that's kind of up to us. But here's what we do know. Elders were selected, elected, appointed, whatever you want to call it, in Acts 14, 23. That was Paul's M.O. That's what he did every time. Getting elders there. We see it, we see it in, 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 in Titus where he tells Titus, appoint elders throughout all the cities in Crete. All right, so here, though, why doesn't he say to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the elders and the deacons. Well, he doesn't say with the elders and the deacons because the bishops are the elders. If that's not true, then Paul contradicted his own M.O. by, when he wrote Philippians, he started the church at Philippi some 10 years before he writes this. So at this point, they're going to have elders in their church. Because that is what Paul did. He appointed elders. So if he's addressing just the bishops and the deacons, he's identifying two offices, actually three people here. We've already identified three people before, didn't we? We identified elders as the leaders, Christ as the head, elders and deacons as the leaders, and then the congregation. Well, here he's identifying the bishops. He's identifying the deacons. We know when he's talking to the, about the bishops here, He's talking about elders. We know that because he always appointed elders. And if he is addressing just bishops as something separate, then that means he's totally ignoring the elders altogether, which he would not do. And so that, again, just giving you evidence for the interchangeability and the interconnectedness of the terms. As you read through your New Testament, here's what you find. You find shepherds, overseers, elders, and pastors, they are all the same thing. Now you say, Pastor John, you're emphasizing this so much. Why is it so important? You'll find out next week. But you have to leave here today understanding this to be the truth. 1 Peter chapter 5. Watch what Peter does here. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders who are among you, I exhort, Peter says, Watch what Peter says. He says, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Now, here's what I want you to do. As we read through from here on, I want you to see if there's any familiarity from Acts chapter 20. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd the flock. All right, so, so Peter's reinforcing what Paul's already said. This is not your flock, this is God's flock, all right? But go back to the first word, shepherd. Is that, is that familiar? What did Paul say back in Acts chapter 20? Shepherd, right? All right, so Peter's already reinforcing, which is among you serving as overseers. Now, at first, it's gonna, that, that's actually a participle. But it is, it's from the same root word as an overseer. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And so already, here's what Peter's doing. Peter is already associating these words, these terms, with being an elder. He says, I'm an elder. I'm addressing elders. Here's what you do. You shepherd the flock of God as overseers or as bishops. It would be the same thing as bishops and as overseers. Now watch what he says. He says, not as being lords over those entrusted to you. Don't you love that? Peter says, now wait a minute. These are not your people. and You don't rule over these people. You're shepherding as an overseer. You're a leader, but you are not lording over. Listen, there are pastors out there all over the country that are lording over their, their people, and they are in violation of Scripture. You do not lord over people. You do not rule over people. You don't intimidate people. You don't manipulate people. You lead people as Christ leads you. Humbly before God. 
So not lording over people, as, as over those entrusted to you, but watch this, but being examples to the flock. In other words, you, you follow Christ, you be an example, you lead by example. You're not ruling over people, you're setting an example that they can follow you as you follow Christ. And then number two, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. This is what I love about this. Every pastor is not just to emulate Christ as the chief shepherd. He's to submit to Christ as the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd, remember what we talked about, who's the head? Jesus is the head. He's the chief shepherd, not John. So let's go back and read it again with all those things understood. Go back to verse 1. We're just going to read through it again. And then we're going to close. The elders who are among you, I exhort, Peter says. He says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He says in verse 2, number 1, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as an overseer, watch this, not by compulsion but willingly. What does he mean by that? It means this. It means, you know, you shouldn't feel like you have to do this. You should love to do this. If you're a pastor, love to do it. If you don't love to do it, then get out. Number two, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Don't do it for the money. Don't do it for the money. And there's shepherds who are doing it for the money. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And here's how you've been an example. When Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. So what do we take from all this? Well, the office of elder is richly embedded in Jewish history. But no matter how familiar in the Jewish community, it, rep it represents a brand new and fresh functionality here in the first century New Testament church. So what we're taking from this is simply this. We can all agree here that Peace Haven, we must continue to employ men who exemplify the responsibility of, his, of an elder, an overseer, a bishop, a shepherd, they must be men of great repute. And we must commission elders, just like the elders in Acts chapter 20, just like the elders in 1 Peter chapter 5. We must commission these men and recognize a need for these men called by God to lead the church and to protect the doctrines of Scripture and teach and preach the Word of God as it was intended from the onset. God used eldership in the Old Testament economy and he used it in a specific way. But as we move into this New Testament era, God is using eldership in a similar way, but in some senses, he's using it in a very, very different way. And so I ask you to do this. I ask you to remind yourself that we are in a war zone. There is a battle going on between two kingdoms. The two kingdoms are these, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of self. This morning, you are in a battle between kingdom of God and kingdom of self. And it's a constant battle that goes on. That's why we need men as elders, men as overseers, men as pastors, men as shepherds. We need those men standing with us, standing among us as examples. They must be men who are winning the fight, winning the war over self and pushing themselves toward the kingdom of God. And so today, I remind you, we need elders who are mature. Elders who are mature in their faith so they can protect the doctrines of this church. We need elders who pastor and who shepherd. Uh, can't say enough about this. And, and, I, and I know I'm not the best at this. But an elder must love his people to the point that he's willing to give his life for them. A shepherd that's not willing to give his life, what that means is simply this. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay it out for you, okay? If a man walks through that door and he's got a machine gun, if I'm a true shepherd, I'm not running. If I'm a true shepherd, I'm going there. If it ever happens and I run, fire me. If a man walks through that door and he's got a machine gun and I'm not going for him, then I don't need to be here. Because I'm following the chief shepherd and the chief shepherd gave his life 
for his people. So if I don't run toward him, you say, Pastor John, I just don't agree with that. I think you should run. Let the security team get them. What if the security team can't get to them quick enough? Well, the security team's here to protect you. No, no, they're not. I'm here to protect you. That's my job. So if I'm not willing to take a bullet for my congregation, I don't need to be standing here. Now you say, Pastor John, that's just that that that's it's kind of dramatic and and yeah, but it's it should be true. It should be true. And so I say to you today, you know, if I'm if I'm the shepherd, I better be willing to give my life just as Jesus is willing to give his life for his flock. That's why it's not all glory. You say, Well, I'd love to be a pastor. Okay, are you ready to give your life for your flock? Because it's really not your flock anyway. It's, but if I'm called to be the under shepherd and the chief shepherd gave his life, I better be willing to give mine. So don't ever walk through that door with a machine gun because I'm coming after you. I hope, <laughs> you know. You say, Pastor John, you don't ever know what you would do. You're exactly right. You know, I may stand here and say I'm going for him. The day comes and I might be running. You never know what you'll do, but I'll tell you what I hope I'm doing. I'm hoping I'm standing between him and you. That's what I hope I'm doing. He says, Pastor John, you could die. That's true. And what that means is you won't have to listen to long sermons anymore. You know, maybe you get somebody to preach short sermons, right? Say that jokingly. I know it's not a joking matter. But today it's so important that you have the right men in the right position with the right attitude and the right calling. Men who are shepherds, men who are overseers, men who are pastors, men who are elders. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful today, Lord, that you've given us such clear direction and description. Lord, I think to a large degree prescription. Lord, as we w work through these messages over the next three weeks, God, I pray that you would give us clarity as to what we need to do as a church. God, I first of all thank you for the opportunity to be here as the lead pastor. God, I do pray that within me that I am willing to give my life for this church and for these people. God, if I'm able to do that, it's only because you've enabled me and empowered me to do it. It sure doesn't come from within me. God, I pray that the teaching, the preaching that comes from this pulpit, whether it be by me or another staff member or visiting speaker, Lord, would always protect the doctrines of the church, the doctrines of the Bible. God, if there's a young man, an older man in our congregation that feels a call from you, God, I pray that they would submit to it, that they would respond, and God, that you would use them in that capacity. Lord, as we as a church consider some changes in our church polity, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would be wise and we'd be biblical in all that we do. Lord, there may be somebody here today that just doesn't even know you as Savior. Lord, as we mentioned before, Lord, we require that men and women be saved to join our church. Lord, there may be somebody here today that doesn't even know you as Savior. Lord, would you save them today? Lord, remind them that you purchase them with your own blood if they believe on you. Lord, as Paul even said, that you purchased this church with your blood. God has purchased this church with his blood. We're grateful for it today. Lord, we lift you up and we exalt you today. Take just a moment, if you would, please. Just pray and ask God. I, I, I know that there's a lot of information, information overload today. I understand. You're drinking from a fire hydrant today, many of you. But I hope that today, that in the midst of all of it, that you've got the gist of it. And that's simply this. God is calling men into ministry to guard churches and to protect churches. And I would ask you right now that you would pray a couple of things. Number one, first of all, pray and say, Lord, are you calling me? Number two, pray and say, Lord, if you're not calling me, give me wisdom to select and to elect the right men. And then number three, Lord, give me the wisdom, give me the wherewithal to support the men that you put in that position. Number one, is God calling you? Number two, do you have the wisdom to elect and to select the right man? Number three, 
Can you get behind those men and can you follow them as they follow Christ? Those things settled. Let's all stand together. Let's sing together as a church today. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm right here. I pray that you'll come. I pray that you'll get that thing settled today.
just want to say this today. Y'all were so patient with me today because I know this is a little bit of a long sermon this morning, and I'm going to reward you for the next three weeks. Here's how I'm going to reward you because you sat through this this morning. I'm only going to preach 30 minutes for the next three weeks. You can mark it down. Jared Hoots is somewhere saying it can't happen. It can't happen, but it's going to happen. No, it's going to happen. I promise you it's going to happen for the next three weeks, 30-minute sermons because you endured this one today. I know this was a tough one. I had to get that, uh, had to lay all the groundwork, but next week, next week's uh, elder plurality, the next week's elder integrity, and the next week, elder polity. It will be 30 minutes from the time I step on that spot right there until I say, let's pray. Yeah, put a wager on that. All right, we'll put a wager on it. Can we, we can't do that, can we? <laughs> all right, it's going to happen. I'm telling you, it's going to happen, all right? That's your, re- that's your reward for enduring this today. I apologize for preaching so long. But I needed to get all that out of the way. So thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. And I hope you learned something today. Keep on learning. Kevin, great to have you today. Thank you so much for being here today. Other visitors, we appreciate you being here. Make sure you go by the visitor center. Do we have any announcements? All right. Um, Just to make sure everybody uh, remembers, we do need a lot of volunteers for this D-NOW event that we have coming up. There's a sign-up sheet. If you'll be willing to volunteer on the Welcome Center desk, just stop by there, put your name on it, and we will put you to work. All right, next week, the John Bowman 30-minute sermon. Uh, You'll believe it when you see it, and it'll happen. All right, God bless you. You are sent.